All right, this morning for our scripture reading, we will be going to the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. I am going to go to chapter 9, and I'm going to read five verses, verses 27 through 31. 27 through 31, a very short little story uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your place, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Let's stand while God's word is being read here this morning. Starting at verse 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, Let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. The title of this message is called this. Why the miracles? If you believe the Bible, which every Christian should do, You must believe the words, and you must believe the actions of Jesus Christ. His words are written indelibly into our minds, and some of those words are written in more permanent ink than others. His actions are played out in our sanctified imaginations. Quite often, if you're like me, wishing that you were there so just so you could witness one of these miracles or listen to him pray or just to be able maybe to just touch his cloak and you too would be healed. The actions of Jesus. He performed many different actions, but one such action that he did throughout the Gospels was this. He performed miracles. Wouldn't it have been nice to have been there and just witnessed one of these miracles with our own eyes? In our reading this past week, in two chapters, in chapters 8 and chapter 9, we see 11 separate miracles, instances, excuse me, where Jesus performs a miracle. In chapter 8, we find five of them. Verse 3, he cleanses a leper. Verse 9, Jesus heals a centurion's servant, and he wasn't even there. He just said, go, it'll be done. Verse number 15, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law who was sick with a fever. Verse 26, Jesus calms the winds and the sea. And in verse 32, Jesus cast out demons from two men. So there's a quite a variety of miracles. And then when you get into chapter 9, we see six more miracles. Verses 2 and 6. Jesus heals a paralytic, and he forgives a paralytic. And trust me, my friends, when we get forgiven of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, that is a miracle. Verse number 22, Jesus heals a woman who is suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years. Verse number 25, Jesus raises a young girl back to life. Verse 29, Jesus restores the sight of two blind men. Verse 32, Jesus casts out a demon and restores speech to a man. And in verse 35, it says this, Jesus was healing every disease and every sickness. So he was doing all of these things, all of these miracles he was doing in the region. Jesus' miracles displayed his power over sin in Matthew 9, verse 2. And over nature, the winds and the sea, over disease, over demons, and over death. Jesus certainly had the power and the authority over all of these things. And they all ended up in miracles. So here's the question we're going to answer this morning. A very simple question, but one that has probably a kind of a complicated answer. So why did Jesus perform miracles? Here's one reason that you may hear nowadays, and it's becoming more popular today among those in liberal churches and in those who are non-churched alike that they will say this. He did miracles because Jesus was a social justice 
warrior, and that's why he performed his miracles. His mission was to clean up society. Well, yes, we do know this. He healed many. He healed thousands, probably tens of thousands of people. And he fed many. We know that he fed the 5,000 on one occasion, and that was just 5,000 men. It could have been as many as 20,000 people. On another occasion, he, he fed 4,000 with making food out of, really, nothing, ex nihilo, out of nothing. There's no doubt that he did those wonderful things to the people. But these miracles of healing and making food out of nothing have nothing to do with Jesus being a social justice warrior, a term we hear quite often in today's society. Because if Jesus was a true social justice warrior, then he would have come to change the complete structure of the government and to make sure that everybody was taken care of physically with food, clothing, and shelter, and taken care of financially. But we never see Jesus creating money, do we? He never creates money to make sure that everyone's economically at the same level, which is part of the efforts of a social justice warrior. So he certainly had the power and authority to make money, to make money out of nothing. He can make food out of nothing. He can certainly make coins appear out of nothing. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. Actually, the only statement that Jesus ever makes concerning government is when he tells the Pharisees to give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. That was it. Otherwise, Jesus was simply God incarnate in a capitalist society with no intentions of changing that society in those ways. Why not? He had the power. He had the authority. Why wouldn't he want to have changed the society? Answer, because that was not his mission. And his miracles had everything to do with leading up to what his mission was. So let's talk about his mission and learn how these miracles fit into that mission. In your bulletin, you have five fill in the blanks, and let's go through these here this morning. The first fill in the blank would say this The miracles of Jesus were signs, they were signs for the people. We've been over this before. What do signs do? A sign gives direction of some sort. And we see a great example of this in John chapter 3 when Jesus is talking with one of Israel's religious leaders. His name is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says this to Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus was smart enough to figure out that the, and identify that the miracles of Jesus were signs. But where were the signs pointing? And as we know, and as Jesus points out in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, he says this, and he starts scolding him kind of in a way. He says this, Nick, as a teacher of Israel, you should be understanding where these signs are pointing. Which leads us to our next fill in the blank. Where do the signs point? Fill in the blank number two. Jesus' miracle signs pointed to fulfilled prophecy to fulfilled prophecy. Theologians estimate that anywhere that there are over probably around 300 plus Old Testament prophecies prophesying about Jesus Christ. And one such prophecy comes in the form of Isaiah chapter 35 verse 5 which says this, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped then the lame will leap as a, like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. And this is exactly 
the types of miracles that Jesus was doing. He was healing the blind. He was healing the deaf. He was healing the lame. He was healing the mute, along with healing so many other types of infirmities. His miracles fulfilled prophecy about the Messiah, which is our next fill in the blank. These prophecies pointed to the Messiah. There was a Messiah that was long awaited in Israel. And as most of you already know, a lot of the Jews, especially the ruling class, thought that this Messiah was going to be a government type leader, a warrior, so, so to speak, and overthrow the whole Roman government and be a social justice warrior. But he wasn't. Many understood the prophecies concerning him and the signs that he would perform and knew that these signs pointed to a Messiah. In one such case is in John chapter 6. Jesus had just got done feeding the multitude of 5,000. And in verse 69, Peter says this. Jesus asked Peter and everybody a question. Do you want to leave me too? He asked. And Peter responds by saying this. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter was starting to connect the dots between the miracles to the prophecy to the Messiah. This Messiah, so, so far we know that the miracles were signs that pointed to the prophecies that pointed to the Messiah. But there's one more step in the progression to determine what the miracles had to do with the mission of Jesus. Because we know this, miracles in and of themselves were not his mission. And what was that? Step number four. This Messiah, who we Christians know as Jesus, will save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. The angel speaking to Joseph and says this. She, meaning Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. My friends, that is the mission, to save the people from their sins. The mission of the Messiah was not and is not to make people well or to cast out demons or to calm the seas or to raise the dead. The mission of the Messiah, Jesus, was and is to seek and to save his people, those who are lost, to save his people from their sins. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus states his mission very simply, and he says this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. People like me, people like you. Jesus came to fix our problem. And our problem is not that we have physical infirmities, although so often we do. He didn't come to fix our relationship issues, although many times we do. He didn't come to fix our low self-esteem, although sometimes we have low self-esteem. He did not come to fix poverty in the world, and we all know that there is poverty in the world. He did not come to fix those things. Our problem is this. Our problem is we are sinners, and our sins have given us a death penalty which carries a debt that nobody, none of us in here, could ever, ever pay by ourselves. Our relationship that we once had with the Father has been severed because of our sins. And Jesus came to restore that and to pay that debt for each and every one of us. One final point that I'm going to make here because we have one more uh, fill in the blank, I believe. Out of the 11 miracles found in our reading this past week, I purposely picked this one of the two blind men in Matthew chapter 9. So why did I pick that one? 
Because in verse 30, and you can read that if you still have your Bibles open, in verse 30, Jesus tells the two men this, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone what I have done. Now, if you're like me, and you have been blind, and you can now see, guess what the first thing I'm going to do is? I'm going to go on out and tell somebody. But the man who just cured me told me not to tell anybody. Why would Jesus ever say something like that? Why would he tell the blind men and many others? Actually, did you know this? In the four Gospels, there's actually 11 different occasions where Jesus says, don't tell anyone what you just saw, what you just witnessed, the healing that you just underwent. He tells them not to say anything. We find the answer to that. Why does he say that? Because the answer is in Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. He had just, Jesus had just been transfigured on the mountain. And Peter, James, and John were up there on the mountain. And Jesus says this. He says this. Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And the fill in the blank would say this. The mission of Jesus is not the signs, is not the prophecy, is not the Messiah, is this. The mission of Jesus is the cross and the resurrection. The miracles, the signs all lead up to the cross and the resurrection. These words of Jesus really sums up today's message. The mission is not the miracles. The mission is the cross. The mission is the resurrection. Until when? Until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And then and only then are people really going to understand what the mission is. Because up until then, they were having a little bit of trouble connecting all the dots. Folks, I'm going to tell you something you already know. We live in a fallen world. And I'm sure that we would all agree that we don't like a lot of what is going on in our society today, especially right here in the United States of America, the greatest country in the whole world. But we must say this that we are fortunate enough to live in a time and to live in a place where each and every one of us has access to the Word of God. In the time of Jesus, the people, they had to connect all these dots to understand who Jesus was and what his mission really was. But we know, because we're fortunate, because we have the dots already connected for us right here, right here in this book. The dots have been connected for us. We have preachers and we have teachers who can easily explain the miracles and their purpose and point those to the real mission of Jesus. And the real mission of Jesus was this, to seek that which was lost and to save those who are lost. So I'm going to ask a fairly generic question here this morning. Probably one I should ask more often. Are you lost today? Are you found today? Have you been found by Jesus? Have you been saved from your sins? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have? That if today you never make it home from this church because something very terrible happens to you, do you know beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will be spending eternity with Jesus Christ? No doubt in my mind. Because if you have a doubt in your mind, maybe you have not been saved from your sins. And you need to be looking beyond the miracles. And you need to discover the Messiah. 
look beyond the miracles because the miracles point to the Messiah. And the Messiah is going to save the people from their sins. And the only way we understand that is when we understand the cross and when we understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His mission is not to fix your health problem, although I pray that he does. His mission is to fix our sin problem. The worst thing that could ever happen to a human being and that is dying and going to hell is never going to happen to me because the dots have been connected I understand how this relates to this how this relates to this and praise the Lord he's done this because I trust in this I trust in the cross I trust in the resurrection I trust everything this book says and points to the Savior who died for my sins who's going to save me from myself and trust me most of you don't know me outside of here sometimes myself is not a very good person <laughs> confession time If you haven't already done it, Romans 10, verse 13. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you don't know Jesus today, call on Jesus today. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That was verse, chapter 8, verse 32. And then 10 verses later, in verse 42, Jesus says this. And if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. Folks, don't stop at the miracles. Don't stop at the signs. Go all the way to the cross and the resurrection because that's where the real healing is at. That's where the real healing is at. There isn't a greater miracle than to see a person go from here to here, from unsaved to saved, to go from an old creature to a what? A new creation in Christ, amen. Let's look beyond the miracles.